I love music. I took music in high school and I've played the drums for a good decade now. Here's one of my favourite albums. Yes, I do like Green Day. Bite me. However, there is one album I hold close to my heart. One that is criminally underrated. I Am Gemini. A creepy concept album from the amazing band Cursive. This album was released in 2012 to mixed reviews and it's generally regarded as the weakest album Cursive have released. Which is not saying a lot because all of Kersif's albums are fucking amazing. I'm urging you right now to go and listen to some of them. Go listen to The Ugly Organ, go listen to this one. Go listen to Get Fixed, their newest album, it's brilliant. I'm here to argue the opposite of this being the worst album. I believe this album is absolutely amazing and this video is going to be me walking you through it. The album begins with a track called This House Alive and it's a perfect introduction to our protagonist, Cassius, a reformed criminal who has returned to his now inherited family home, the home of his parents which he doesn't actually know and now he won't know because they're dead. We begin the track with Cassius talking of voices in the attic, indicating he knows he's not alone. As he enters the parlour, he sees angels and demons and talks of shedding his snakeskin past, which as we find out isn't exactly true. We also learn that he has arrived home after a car crash placed him in hospital. Keep that in mind, dear viewer. Cassius gives us some more information about himself by saying, an orphan, thrown out to the wolves, not prodigal, far worse. I was hustled, I was scorned, made a criminal, but I stand here reformed. Then, to round out the song after screaming the title of the album, as all good albums should, he questions himself and asks if he's lucid or losing it which leads us into a second song and introduces us to Pollock. Warmer Warmer is the suitably eerie introduction to Pollock, the twin in the attic. He watches from behind walls and makes creepy remarks indicating he knows a lot more than Cassius does. He paints Cassius out as blowing through the house like a hurricane and noting he will wish he never found out the truth once he knows. In a very childlike manner he decides to play a game of hot and cold, a childhood game where you and your friends find each other by shouting the words hot or cold. Then towards the end of the song as the music dies down, he sings a poem warmer warmer to Cassius, almost taunting him. Warmer warmer house on fire, warmer warmer cut the telephone wire, warmer warmer cried the farmer's wife, warmer warmer with a carving knife, warmer warmer squealed the little pig, warmer warmer let me in. Then the music kicks back in to end the song in a rather climactic fashion, similar to the climactic meeting of the two brothers. That's right, it's a classic secret evil twin trope and it's got a rather groovy twist. Sun and Moon on the face of it is a track built to endear us to Pollock. He describes himself using lowly words and places Cassius on a pedestal. He paints himself out as a lowly person who is always going to be loyal to Cassius. However, this is obviously a ruse, as we will find, with Pollock's bigger plan. He is purposely attempting to have Cassius put his guard down with lines such as You're actually here acknowledging me that I am the we that makes us we, almost painting Cassius as a celebrity or a godlike being. This is of course all undone in the next track, however, Drunken Birds. Drunken Birds is where we meet the real Pollock. The first lyric states his intentions clearly. Mimic raised the most ulcerous form of mockery. It rewards me handsomely, making us realise that what has happened and that Cassius is not safe with him, and we worry what's going to happen next. Cassius is fed an elixir, which will knock him out. All the while angels and demons are still about the place, which again, make note. The final line where Pollock screams night night is again rather childish, which makes sense in the bigger picture, as he spent his whole life in the shadows, or more realistically the attic. So it would be fair that to expect his vocabulary to be childlike. However, he does know such words as ulcerous, which I had to google. I'm a physics major, not an English major, fuck off. So it does slightly seem out of place, but we'll get into this deeper soon, trust me. We enter then the first of two intervals of the album, our first being called Lullaby for No Name, where we see Pollock looming over his brother, almost pitying him. But as you will see, Pollock isn't one for pity or emotions, unless it's self-serving. Double Dead is an absolute doozy. Pollock is now completely 
completely in his element. He drops the mask and we see him ranting as we begin to realise he is so much more than a childish villain. Throughout the song we see him talk about the boulder of Sisyphus, almost signifying that it was inevitable, as Sisyphus was doomed to push the same boulder up a hill every day for it to just roll back down. It's also noted that Pollock is performing a surgical procedure on Cassius in the song. Looking for something, something we will get into soon enough. Towards the end of the song, Cassius wakes up and then is knocked out again, as Pollock continues his mad ramblings and finishes up his surgery for the next track, Gemini. Gemini shows Cassius waking up, noting dried blood on his neck and a rather nasty headache. He realises that he has a nasty head wound of course, courtesy of Pollock. After gaining his bearings, he realises that something is seriously wrong, indicated by the lines, something is shifting in this symmetry, something is missing in my memory. He moves to look in the mirror, noting the reflection looks different somehow. And then this is where we fall down the rabbit hole of insanity of this album. Pollock pulls Cassius through the mirror into his world. What? This can be perceived in two ways, I think. Either this is symbolic of Pollock taking control and becoming the brother who will see the world and Cassius is now relegated to the attic. Or, and this is my personal favourite, this is literal. Pollock is pulling Cassius through the mirror and into madness. Either way, it's absolutely brilliant and it leads us perfectly into the next track. Twin Dragons and Hello Skeletons, a join track, is act two of the album, where Pollock is mad with power holding all of the cards and he has Cassius exactly where he wants him. We see this most clearly with his carnival barker Passade and his constant self-praise referring to himself as the Swan and the Twin Dragon, whilst defaming Cassius referring to him as the Beast. He also refers to himself as the Gemini, believing himself to be some sort of prophet or messiah, going so far as to refer to himself as the second coming, a complete contrast to Cassius's line in This House Live, where he refers to himself as not a prodigal, far worse. This furthers Pollock's insanity, showing how evil he is and now with Cassius fully awake and aware, chained to the bed, he sees this and realises what a mistake he's actually made. It's best reflected in the second part of the song, Hello Skeletons, where Cassius sees his past sins rising. Perhaps this is a metaphor for this mistake being a footnote in a larger story at play. It ends with Pollock dancing across the room and leaving to find something he's desperately looking for in true Carnival Barker style. Wow wow wow! Sees Pollock at a carnival in search of a pair of conjoined twins. The guitars are jumpy and the heavy rhythms show how Pollock's mind is racing and he's genuinely just having the time of his life. It's a lot better than being in the attic, let's be honest. Just a side note, has anyone ever seen My Parents Are Aliens and they've got a spaceship in the attic? I learned about that show the other day and it's terrifying. He sees Conquettes and Kung Tsupi with stress. If I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry. Seemingly blocking him from his objective, almost as if a higher power is attempting to keep him from what he seeks. However, after much struggle, he finds what he's looking for. The sisters Celsi, a pair of conjoined twins, which, when he sees them, memories of his own come flooding back. He describes thoughts long lost come crashing in, remembering a birthday party in June, blood on the orphanage ceiling, almost hinting that Cassius and Pollock have been conjoined. This theme is only built up when Pollock sees a younger Cassius, remarking what wicked wolves we have become, suggesting that the pair were supposed to stay as a we, and part of Cassius remained with him, either through the trauma of his life or the insanity he clearly experiences. The sisters go on to explain that without the sun there can be no moon, which alludes to the previous song, Sun and Moon, with this used to refer to the twins. It also relates to Gemini, where Pollock refers to Cassius as the sun going into a deep slumber and his moon being on the rise, which is brilliant. The song ends with Pollock remarking, wow, 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 at his amazement that the, there are people just like him. Cutting back to Cassius for the second interval, he is still chained to the bed, lost in thought about what has transpired. As he is lost in this awful chain of events, two angels reluctantly release him from his chains. This can only spell trouble, as now Cassius is angry. He's fully aware of Pollock's plan to get rid of him one way or another, to be the moon that is on the rise. 
and he only wants one thing. Revenge. Cat and Mouse shows the battle between these two, with Cassius being referred to as a mouse and Pollock as the cat. This is representative of a shift in dynamic, however, as the mouse wins the battle and the cat is caught off guard and defeated. Cassius checks Pollock for a scar after catching him asleep in the parlour. Tired out after a long day of causing mischief and saying wow a lot, I imagine. He realises that they share the same scar, further enforcing the theme of conjoined twins. Cassius says, let's start knocking the nine lives off, clearly stating his intentions unlike Pollock. Cassius isn't hiding behind a facade and is acting on pure anger alone. As the battle ensues, it's referred to as a hunt, with Cassius remarking here kitty kitty. It is clearly shown that Cassius is leading the situation for the first time in this whole album. He is in control. As the song draws to a close, we hear kill the demon, kill your doppelganger, which is almost definitely Cassius's thought process. And he wins having Pollock beat, and it's brilliant. Honestly amazing. I'm, I'm struggling not to gush. And it leads us perfectly into the penultimate song. Birthday Bash is Cassius's ultimate downfall. Having Pollock tied up and deciding that the only way to end the madness is to kill a pair of them in the home which has caused such misery and insanity. We see Pollock try to manipulate Cassius once more in vain attempts to save his own skin. He says, stab with all your heart, I want to see you red, almost egging him on in hopes that he will revert his decision, believing that this is what he wants. Cassius refers to the action as a birthday bash for the pair, which is almost a morbid juxtaposition as this is where they're going to die. And sure enough, they do as Cassius, whilst manically screaming, blows the pair up to high heaven and the band breaks down into an eagerly manic thrashing of their instruments. Oh. oh, you need to listen to it, man. And it beautifully leads us into the final track. Eulogy for No Name brings the album to a close in a dramatic fashion and creates a theory for the album which I've been pondering in my brain. It takes place in a hospital and depicts an old man dying whilst also rounds out our story of two brothers. The man even names himself Gemini. My theory is that this man is Cassius, and this whole album is him in the hospital wrestling with his angels and demons of his life and his darker side, Pollock. It's in his head. It's not real. And it's insane. The significance of the story is only amplified when I sort of come up with this. It's insane. The song even backs up the theory, pinned by his fiendish inner twin being the main focal point. The song ends with the man dying, therefore ending the story outright as the hospital is struck by lightning, splitting into two and falling apart, much like the characters of Cassius and Pollock. This album has had a place in my heart like no other and it is a brilliant piece of art. The concept, whilst overdone in TV, cough cough, The Simpsons, cough cough, works amazingly and it blew me away on first listen, which was on a bus home after one of the worst weeks of my life. It's a godsend of an album, and it is criminally underrated. I urge you to go out, go onto Spotify, Amazon Music, do people use that? iMusic, iTunes, Apple Music, um, what's the other one? Deezer, Deezer, go on Deezer and listen to it. I don't even know if it's on Deezer, is Deezer still a thing? I've put it on screen if it's still a thing. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a bit different from the usual stuff on the channel, we usually go for video essays and knowledge based stuff, but I wanted to give you something whilst I was on hiatus with university and I thought this would be the best thing for it because I've been binging this album again. From university onwards there will be more regular and frequent videos, I promise. Don't hold me to it though, I'm shit with schedules. As always. A massive thank you to my wonderful editor, Dogs Dogs, who had to sit and read a story's worth of rambling about this album. I thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all very soon.